We're lucky today to have a very talented faculty member with us. Dan Keefe is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and an electronic magician. He's also an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. His work centers on scientific data visualization and interactive computer graphics. Professor Keefe has a formidable academic background. He did postdoctoral work at Brown University jointly with the Departments of Computer Science and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Rhode Island School of Design. He received his PhD in 2007 from Brown University's Department of Computer Science and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering summa cum laude from Tufts University. His recent awards include the National Science Foundation Career Award, the University of Minnesota Guillermo E. Borja Award for Research and Scholarly Accomplishments, the University of Minnesota McKnight Land Grant Professorship, and the 3M Non-Tenured Faculty Award. He shares multiple best paper awards with his students and collaborators, and his research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the National Academies of Keck Futures Initiative, the U.S. Forest Service, and industry. In addition to his work in computer science, Dan has also published and exhibited work in top international venues for digital art. Please help me welcome Dan. Thank you so much, Tom. I never knew. <laughs> uh, welcome. Welcome back, everyone. It is so fun to talk with you today. So um, in fact, I was remembering that this is actually the room where I interviewed about eight years ago <laughs> and gave a talk. So, um, so this feels really great to be talking uh, to all of you. And um, I'm kind of an unusual beast, I guess. I'm a computer scientist, um, but also an artist. And so um, that's one of the, the themes, sort of the combination of those two things uh, that really has pervaded my work. Um, and it even extends, as Tom and I were just talking, to things like teaching students how to communicate about engineering and computer science. So um, we do a lot with visual communication. I teach computer graphics. I teach data visualization. Um, I teach a lot of the things that you see in the movies, actually, like Pixar movies. Uh, but when my students come to me and say, we want to work on the movies, we want to make video games, I say, well, that's great, but you could also do science with that. <laughs> uh, so that's sort of what I try to teach them. Um, let me show you a few things about what we do um, in my research group. And it's kind of a fun title. Um, and I have to tell you where this idea of magical user interfaces came from. Um, I actually was part of this really neat workshop. Um, it turns out there's this basically this castle in Germany, which is fantastic. It's basically a retreat for computer scientists. And they get people together from around the world. They invite people. Um, and it's basically a, a chance for scholars internationally to get together and, and think about what's the next big thing. Um, and of course, there's lots of beer. <laughs> <laughs> and so as part of this, one of the things that we did was um, a, a subgroup of us got together and we said, you know, what does the future of computing look like? We said, wouldn't it be neat if it was about making things feel magical? Um, and then, of course, we had to figure out what that means. So we talked for two hours, and then finally somebody said, well, gee, why don't we look up the definition of magical? <laughs> 
Uh, and so we did. And uh, this is the definition that I like most. Beautiful or delightful in such a way as to seem removed from everyday life. And then there's some great synonyms, supernatural, magnificent, you know, breathtaking, wonderful. And this to me just felt great, you know. And I said, well, gee, this is what I want computers to be like. I don't want to work with a mouse and a keyboard, you know. I want things to feel magical. I want the computer to feel as though it knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> and that I can communicate to it that I can communicate to it, not everything I'm thinking, but just something, <laughs> uh, that I can communicate to it just as if, you know, I'm having a conversation and interacting with a person. Um, and to me, that would feel magical, you know? So we started kind of thinking in this direction. Um, and one of the things that, to me, uh, is just sort of the hallmark of that is that you must kind of be able to see output from the computer, and you must be able to get information into the computer in new ways that go beyond this, this keyboard and the mouse approach that we've been using. So let me give you just a couple of examples. This is actually a pretty fun one. Now, here, let me stop for a moment. Uh, this, is, uh, this actually is with a keyboard and a mouse, but um, it's thinking about a, a relatively simple problem, sliding your way through a video. So imagine you're looking at footage from a security camera or something like that, and you want to figure out, well, when did this car leave the parking lot? Um, you've probably seen something like this, um, and this we might call linear video browsing. So in order to find this time, you kind of scrub through the video, and you're searching, and you're searching, and whoa, oh, there it is. There's a spot. What if we could do this? What if you could simply grab onto the car <laughs> and pull it out? <laughs> and of course, there's some really fun extensions of this. <laughs> okay. um, but this is something that to me feels magical. I'm not used to being able to do that. You know, I know of this thing as a video. Oh, it's a video. I have to watch it in a linear progression. Well, if you step back and think about it, you don't really. How could we design computers to more appropriately mimic what, what do what we want them to do? You know? And so if the task that I want to accomplish in this case is to look for when something changes in the video, why don't I just indicate that to the computer and get it to intelligently show me the result? Okay. So I'm going to show you a few more examples, and we'll, we're going to we're going to go even beyond the video as we get going here. Um, here's actually, here's another fun kind of simplistic example. I don't have a video of this one, but I just want to uh, describe it to you a little bit. It looks like a cartoon drawing, right? The thing is that this is a smart system. And so in this example, you can actually grab onto the sun and pull it across the sky. And guess what happens? The shadow of the sandcastle updates. You know, and it's so it just feels like I'm not expecting that. That feels otherworldly. I know what a cartoon is, and it doesn't update dynamically. You know, so I want to try to change the way we think about computers. Let's see if we can do things we don't expect. You know, and that's sort of where the magic comes in. Now we do this in lots of different domains, and I want to show you a couple examples of that. I'm going to talk today about. Um, some tools that artists can use to create 3D models directly in the air in virtual reality. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, something that's a bit more scientific. I'll show you an example of some of the scientific visualization work we do. So this is working with um, orthopedists who study uh, people who have neck pain and try to improve treatments uh, for neck and back pain. Um, and then I'll show you a few experimental ideas, things we're thinking about. How does the desktop of the future look different? How does the computer you have on your desk end up looking uh, different in the future? OK, so let's start with um, uh, some of this connection to art that I was mentioning earlier. So one of the things you might be interested in is um, we do an incredible amount of drawing upon artistic tradition and also expertise. We bring artists in. We work with them. And um, 
we've done that here at the University of Minnesota with folks in the art department, but we've also worked a lot with the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Um, so here's an example of a picture of one of their grab graphic design studios. It's messy. <laughs> There's stuff all over the walls. You know, it's really exciting actually to bring a bunch of engineers and computer scientists over there to see this workspace because it's so different than what we typically do. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And, um, and then we bring them together with computer scientists. We're working now also with some professional artists. One is Francesca Samsell, and she has an interesting career path, starting as a mural painter, uh, but more recently uh, working in data visualization to help climate scientists. Uh, so much of we, what we do is help people make sense of data. And the best way to get new information into the human brain, through the visual system. Okay, so we kind of latch on to that idea. But then we're stuck with the problem of how do I make your data visual? And we can do some of that as computer scientists, but we also need to turn to people who have studied um, and have a tradition of basically explaining complex information visually. Um, and that's where we bring a lot of the art in. Um, one thing I like to do, in, even in my classes, uh, we study critique, and we try, and we prototype things, and we do a lot of experimentation. Actually, a lot of our visual design process is very similar to what you might find in an art and design school. Um, and this scribble um, actually illustrates some of that process. So a lot of what you find in design-oriented curriculum is that you're taught to experiment. Go all over the place. Try crazy things. But do a lot of that up front when the cost to trying new stuff is relatively cheap. And then through that experimentation, you sort of narrow in on a nice path. Um, what I find is that often the computer science students are so excited to get their hands on the keyboard that they want to program right away. And so this design step is often lost. It's like, let me start programming this idea up. And so we have a process that I call program like the wind that often looks more like this. You're going along and you think, whew, this is really good. I'm right on the right track here. And then, oops. <laughs> OK. And so what I'm interested in doing also is part of this collaboration, we're trying to bring the insight from art and things like that. But some of it's also process. Uh, if you're doing something that's visual, I want to iterate on that many, many, many times. And it's hard to do that iteration if I have to do three weeks of programming in between each refinement. So we mock things up on paper. Um, I made my students use paper and colored pencil for their first assignment in the visualization class. They looked at me like I had four eyes. <laughs> uh, but I think it works. <laughs> um, and these are some of the things that, um, that the, you know, the artists contribute, new ideas new ideas. Um, one of the things we found is the paper and pencil is great, but a lot of the serious data visualization we're trying to work on does happen in these new environments like virtual reality. And so here you can see an example of one uh, environment we have in my lab. It's called a cave. And it's kind of like the Star Trek holodeck or something like that. You basically walk into this, this cube that's made of projection screen walls. Um, and the computer projects all the content around you. And it looks like you're in this alternate computer-generated uh, space. Well, it's really cool for visualizing data, because then you can really just make your data as if it existed right in front of you. Um, but if we want to visualize data in those spaces, and we want artists to get involved with helping us to refine those visuals, uh, one of the problems is they can't program, so they have no way to create there. Uh, so this led us to a whole series of research, um, starting back when I was a PhD student, actually, into new tools to help people create in virtual reality environments. Um, and this tool is actually uh, a way of making something like virtual sculpture. You take a paintbrush and you wave it in the air, and it leaves behind a trail of like 
zero gravity virtual paint. Okay, but it's 3D. You can walk under it. You can look around it. I mean, it's really amazing. And um, it gives us this way of creating. It's really, really pretty, pretty cool. Um, and you can see we had some fun with it, too. I mean, you can <laughs> do all sorts of things, sort of mixing the physical and the virtual. Oh, this is embarrassing, embarrassing for a computer scientist. <laughs> now, what happened here to my talk? OK. All right, so um, actually, once you get um, some experience with this, you can create some works of art that are actually really beautiful digital artworks. So this is something that I sculpted, essentially, in virtual reality using this, um, this system. Here's another piece. Um, but basically what you have is like a 3D sketch pad. And so we also use it for things like um, prototyping ideas for how we might represent data. Um, this was actually a really fun project. We were looking at how air flows around a bat wing. Uh, so trying to help evolutionary biologists understand how bats developed an ability to fly. Um, but all of these are essentially 3D sketches to figure out, it, you know, when we get to the point of really programming up this data visualization, what do we want it to look like? Um, and so we use this tool to, to sketch out all those possibilities. Now this is a more recent incarnation. And this is work with um, one of my PhD students who graduated recently, Brett Jackson, um, has now become a professor at McAllister. And I'll show you an example of some of the things we can do here. Um, this tool allows us to create something that um, is more of a, a surface-based model. Here it comes. Let's try again. OK. Um, and this is also in that same system. But one of the fun parts here is we've actually brought in some sketches we made on paper. But then they become virtual. So you can resize them, place them in space, and it's like you can hang a picture anywhere you want in the air. Um, and then what we're able to do is start pulling curves off of that. And we can build up surfaces. And see, so just briefly went through some of the models we created. So, you know, architects can use this to model things in 3D as if they're, you know, just floating in the air in front of them. Um, artists are excited to use it. Uh, so there's lots of interesting uh, use cases. Uh, this is another example. Now, this is back to 2D, but working with a terabyte of climate data. And we thought, boy, this data is really difficult to visualize. Here's a situation where you want to see things like um, rainfall, but you also want to see temperature. You also want to see wind on the surface and wind in the jet stream layer. If you are really a climate scientist, there's probably about 10 things you're interested in. And those 10 things exist everywhere on Earth. So how do you show 10 data variables in one picture? Um, really tricky to do. But what we did was we turned to artists to help us do that. And we built a system where artists can basically sketch out what they want the data visualization to look like. And then we make sure that that sketch actually matches the data. Um, so it's almost as if you're sketching on top of an invisible canvas of data. Uh, and the artist kind of indicates, oh, here's what I'd like these flow particles to look like. Here's what I'd like the color map to look like. And you can actually paint on color. And then the computer magically <laughs> figures out, oh, well, if you want green over there, then I have to adjust the data mapping on across the entire globe to make sure that green is accurately representing, you know, 30 degrees Celsius or something like this. Um, so it's really fun. And I, I hope you were able to just take a peek, like, right at the end here. I mean, notice, notice the color. <laughs> I mean, this is created by an artist, right? <laughs> uh, it's not the weather map you see on TV. Um, and so that is the kind of thing that we're interested in. 
And in this age where, you know, the data sets get bigger and bigger and more complex, you know, that's what we need to turn to, basically. We need a much more nuanced approach to um, trying to interpret that data. Okay, so some of the tools with artists. Um, let me now tell you about a, a switching gears, uh, thinking about biomechanics. And um, now this is something, you know, many people suffer from uh, back pain and neck pain. You'll probably hear some groans from the audience. And um, if you go to the doctor, uh, they might ask you to do an exercise like this, a flexion extension exercise. So bend your, your neck as far forward as you can, then you know, as far back as you can. Um, and actually, the current clinical practice is really just to measure those two angles, um, which kind of boils everything down to two numbers. But now we have cameras. We have all sorts of other ways of collecting data. And so what if we ask you to do something a little more complex? How about an exercise like this, where you just roll your neck around? If we can capture that motion, um, that actually has potential to tell us a lot more about what's happening um, at different points and could allow you to sort of, could allow the clinicians to really tailor the treatment. Um, so that's what we're after. Uh, now that can be captured with, with cameras, um, which is actually the nicest way, but in this study, um, they use kind of a, I'm embarrassed to show this, kind of a crude, <laughs> Uh, mechanical contraption uh, to check, to basically record this data as people roll their necks around. Um, now, <clears throat> so that's, uh, our collaborators in biomechanics are, are collecting that type of data and they think it holds real potential to, to tailor these treatments. Um, but if you think about what happens with these scientists, they're not asking just one person to come in and do a neck roll, right? they're running a big study. So they may have 200 patients come in, and they may have them come in initially, they may have them uh, do some treatment and then come in for a follow-up. You might have another follow-up six months um, from them. Okay, so 200 patients, you know, four or five trials each. Pretty soon you get up to about 1,000 of these neck rolls, okay? And this is what is so interesting to us. We can actually do fantastic data visualizations of just a single, single patient. I mean, I showed you that skeleton moving earlier. That's basically what they do in the movies. We can show you one very easily, okay? But if you say, now show me a thousand, and how do I analyze the subtle difference in number five as compared to number 678, <laughs> you know? And if I just were to watch all those animations in sequence, I would never be able to tell a difference. Right, so we're thinking about, well, how do I look at an entire collection of about 1,000 people doing this exercise and find the subtle differences and trends that might separate you know, the healthy individuals from the unhealthy? And within that unhealthy group, I want to see even more separation so I can try to adjust how I would, how I would treat um, clinically. Okay. So that's kind of the motivation of what we're, we're interested in doing. And in this work, we call one single neck roll a trial. And really what we're interested in is trends, trends across all those trials. So I have a fun metaphor for you. Think about trends and hairstyles. Okay, so Elvis came along, and everybody wanted Elvis hair, but then the Beatles. Okay, and there were some, there were some Elvis fans who continued on the Elvis trend, okay, but people, but it diverged, and some people were really excited about the Fab Four, so they changed their hairstyle. And then we have Jimi Hendrix, which has stolen some people from the Beatles and Elvis, okay, and they're combining, now there's a new trend, okay, and then I can't remember who we end up with, Bob Marley, I think, <laughs> okay, my students put this together, I love it. Uh, but, okay, so this is essentially what we're doing, and notice that it's a trend that evolves over time, okay? So we're going to construct something analogous, 
but over time for us is going to be the starting point will be when people start with their neck down here, and the ending point will be after they do the exercise and they end up. Okay? And what we want to see is across all these thousands of patients, which ones are Elvis all the way along, <laughs> and which ones diverge from that, um, and then we can start, the, oh, we see some patterns over time, okay? So we have some fancy um, mathematics and computer science that goes behind clustering these data. Um, and I, this is great because we're visual. I can hand wave about this and just say, believe me, there's some fancy math. <laughs> and <laughs> we construct a graph. Um, and then what we do based on this graph, we figure out the numbers are basically how many people are going in this direction. And then we, we analyze that and we pick out the strongest trends. Okay, so this is a very loose explanation of that math. Um, but then once we have the trends in the data, um, we visualize it. We get it into this visual format where people can understand what's happening. And the way we do that in this case is um, actually with, with several components of the visualization that are linked together. Um, so in the top view here, what you see is a 3D graphical representation of that motion. Um, and then because it's hard to see the individual vertebrae, we pull those out. We pull them out into sort of a more abstracted form. Okay, and actually, to connect back up to the first part of the talk, this whole design was something that we developed collaboratively with a graphic design uh, student at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Um, so she came up with the idea for these disks, actually. Um, and then there's one disk here that is highlighted. I think it's you know uh, C4, maybe, the C4 vertebrae. And then that, um, we can see a, a distance map colored over here. And then the bottom, which looks like a subway map, is basically the map of our trends over time. Uh, let's see now. I want to show you that. I'll back up. OK, so the map, the subway map is showing the trends over the time. And the main trend is the one going right down the middle. But then we might see here that, let's say these are the healthy uh, patients. Uh, there could be a group of unhealthy that branches off, and they become different. Um, and then there's some sublines that come off of that, which so you know little variations in that group. Now, one of the things that's neat is that um, each of these visualizations is actually of a trend, not a single trial. And that means we're trying to show what's happening in a group of patients. There's 47 patients here who all have very similar motion. Okay, so we could actually be drawing 47 skeletons here. Okay, but that would be really hard to see. And actually, what we need, do you remember the um, these box plots? where you have something like this. You might have some outliers here. This shows you like the median in your distribution. This shows you one standard deviation, another standard deviation. Maybe there's a couple outliers. So this is a box plot that basically tells you something about a distribution in 2D. But what in the world does that mean in 3D when you're dealing with Motion, we kind of want to show the same thing. So what we do is we show the median trial uh, very solidly. And then if you look closely, there's a little underpainting here that shows you what's happening um, in the other motions. It's a little bit, just a little gray um, outline. And then we also show you plus or minus one standard deviation. So that's where the green and the blue come in. So we've tried to sort of extend this idea of a box plot to 3D. Um, this is what the whole system looks like when you're actually using it. And it's interactive. You can take your mouse and you can click on a particular trend or you can scrub back and forth. Um, you can rotate these things um, and pause it. And it gives you a sense here 
of what, you know, a thousand of these motions, what does that whole data set look like? Um, so we, our collaborators use this to try to dig into their data and uh, discover new things. Okay, I should say, by the way, feel free to interrupt me if there's any questions or thoughts. Um, so, uh, okay, we've looked at some art-inspired 3D modeling, which really got our hands into 3D and kind of working with the computer in a new way. And then I showed you a little bit of um, some, I don't know, maybe a little bit more hardcore uh, scientific visualization, really getting into the data, looking at biomechanics. And um, now I'm gonna kind of mix those a little bit. I wanna show you a couple of projects where we are working with some scientific data, but we're really trying to sort of move the user interface that people work with in the computer um, off the desktop and into the air a little bit. Okay, so one of the first um, examples in this section has to do with uh, multi-touch um, displays. So many of you probably have a smartphone and you know you can touch it and <laughs> it senses that. Um, and it's, it's great, it's a nice way of interacting with a computing device. It works really well for 2D stuff. If you're trying to navigate around a map, you can touch and move it, it works pretty well. What about 3D? Okay, what if we're working with a fluid flow data set that shows all the heating in this room and how air has flown, uh, flowed through the room? Okay, that's actually what this blue data set is here on the side. So it's something that is not just a flat map, but actually like pops out of the display. And we can even wear 3D glasses and see these things pop out of the display. Okay, how do you use touch to interact with that 3D kind of data. Um, so let me show you an example of one thing we did. So we took a big touch screen um, and we do all the normal stuff where you can translate the data around and rotate side to side. But to go in and out of the screen, we treat your fingers like little joysticks. Okay, and so how do we do that? Well, notice the kind of funny antlers sticking out of his hands. <laughs> so those actually have some reflective markers on them, and there are cameras that are tracking the constellation of markers for his left hand and his right hand in order to tell the orientation of his hands. Okay, which is a little annoying to wear, I admit. <laughs> uh, however, um, you can do kind of the same thing with a depth sensing camera um, our phones already have cameras on them, and so in a couple of years, those will probably be depth sensing. Um, and you'll be able to not just touch your device, but also look at the angle that your finger makes as you're touching. You know, so we can use that to explore 3D data. What if you were a surgeon planning a surgery? Wouldn't you want to be able to indicate an angle of approach? You know, so there's all these things we can do when we start thinking about moving our interface to a computer out of just something flat and into space. Okay. So this is uh, our first example. Now, um, here's another fun one. Um, it turns out, you may, have, you may have seen this, if you go down to even Best Buy, you can get a 3D TV um, where you just you know, put on a pair of lightweight glasses and it's like going to the movies. 3D movies, you know, remember the old red, red and green glasses, you know, it's like that, but fancier, you know, um, and they're not colored. Uh, but that's really no more expensive than your normal computer monitor. Okay, so imagine, in a couple of years, it could be right now, every scientist has a 3D TV, essentially, on their desktop, okay, and you just start emailing 3D data sets to each other. You know, and you can see them. You bring them up, they pop out of your screen. Um, we're not, there's nothing in the way of doing that right now. I mean, it's totally practical. Um, but the question that I'm interested in is once we start doing that, how do we interact with those data? What if I want to circle something in the data, you know, and it's 3D, so it's probably a little more than a circle. It's probably like, look at this 
feature over here, and I send it over to my colleague, Bob, who then wants to see that annotation and be able to, to, say, to mark it up himself. Okay, so how do I interact with that kind of data? Um, in this project, this is the data we're actually looking with. It's a stack of imagery that comes from um, a microscopy machine. And what the scientists are analyzing is actually um, the fiber orientations. Uh, these are images of tissue. Okay. But the way that they do this is by looking at 2D slices. So they have to go slice by slice by slice. Okay. And the funny thing is, this is one of my students, and notice just how he's, um, even how he's talking about this. I mean, we found this just in, just even amongst ourselves as we worked into the lab. We're trying to explain, no, 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 I'm talking about the fiber. It comes, it's the one that's coming out of the screen like this, you know, and then it curves around and you just pick up what's ever next to you. You grab a pen and you just start acting it out and talking to the person next to you, you know, and that's how we work as humans. <laughs> so shouldn't the computer be able to understand that? Okay, so that's what we try to do. Now we found with the current um, cameras, we were using the Microsoft Connect in this, we couldn't quite track a pen. It was a little too small. But we could track a rolled up piece of paper, which is almost as good. <laughs> so you just print out a piece of paper, you roll it up, you stick a piece of tape on it, and then it becomes your user interface to the computer. There's a little calibration step. And we show you all that data in 3D. So this is all the same um, fiber structure that's in that microscopy data, but here pulled into 3D. And when you wear the glasses, it pops out of the screen. You can really see it. Now, one of the first things these scientists want to do is they want to very clearly say, show me all the fibers running in this direction. And here's how they do it. They just point this stick. The computer senses it, and it highlights everything running in that direction. Okay? Um, and then we, you can see we can do all sorts of other things. We can grab onto it and rotate things. So we actually detect how many hands are holding this thing. If it's one hand, then that means highlight fibers. If you grab on with two hands, then that means rotate the whole volume. So here is the pointing. Notice how everything's just lighting up here depending on the direction he's pointing it. Um, we can set thresholds, so you can move up and down. We we'll grab on with two hands, and computer says, oh, he's holding it with two hands. He must want to rotate the whole volume. Um, and the interesting thing about this, oh, two things. First of all, um, the scientists behind this, I mean, it's fascinating, because of course they've been doing this in 2D. If they do ever get a 3D view, They've got to indicate this direction, you know, highlight fibers in this direction. They do that with the mouse and the keyboard, you know. And we said, well, try this. What do you think of it? And they said, well, gee, there is no more direct way of indicating a 3D direction to the computer than pointing. You know, and it's true. With a mouse, you've got to, you know, move this thing around and try to figure out, okay, is it really pointing into the screen or out? It's very difficult. Um, and so with this, it's very direct. Uh, now, there's, I mean, there's a little more work to do before we can just talk to the computer the way I described earlier, but, um, but it's going in that direction. Um, okay, now. Okay, I have one last uh, project to tell you about, and this is a fun one to end on. It's actually a collaboration with a professor in the classics department. And he studies ancient rhetoric. So speech giving in ancient Athens, for example. Okay, uh, Really fascinating. So it turns out, actually, one of the most important sites to study is the hillside of the Pnyx. And this was the official meeting place of the Athenians. This is known as the birthplace of democracy. So they would all come to this hill. Um, all the citizens, which unfortunately were all the males, uh, and they um, would listen to speeches, and then they would vote, sometimes by a show of hands, sometimes they'd have a token they would pass in. 
Um, but the interesting thing, as I learned, was that um, if you actually even look at the ancient texts, I mean, it's just like today. It's not like this, you know, very placid <laughs> speech. I mean, there's people in the audience screaming and, you know, throwing things. <laughs> and so, um, so it's, it's really interesting. Um, okay, so this is the site. And the rhetoric scholars, oh, one more really fascinating thing about this site. So as you can see here, it went through three phases of architectural reconstruction. And so in phase one, of course it was much smaller, but there was something else that was really unique. The speaker would stand here on a platform and he would speak up the hill. So the audience would stand on the hill um, in front of him. And in phase two, this is what's so baffling to everyone, they actually reversed the position. Now this meant that they had to haul in enough earth fill to reverse the slope of the mountainside. Why in the world did they do that? Um, actually, if you look down the hill, you can see you know, the Colosseum and all these. They had plenty of meeting places elsewhere in the city. They could have just gone there. What was so special about this hill? You know, obviously had some you know, very, uh, very important meaning uh, as you know, this special place where they went to vote. So they reversed the slope of the hillside. Uh, phase three got even bigger, and they did some other things. Like they changed from having two uh, stairways to access the place to just one. You know, was that important for the voting? Maybe you had to leave through one exit or something. Um, so there's all these questions, and there's even interesting things around, you know, well, how long would it take for people to fill up this space? How many people would actually fit in it? And could you actually hear anything? You know? Um, so all these are interesting questions, but the, um, they're hard to analyze. I mean, ar archaeologists have been looking at this site, but, you know, they're drawing things in 2D. They're trying to sort of figure it out. They never have a chance to experience it. So we create an environment where you can experience uh, what it would have been like uh, to be there. And that's what you see here. It's a virtual reality environment. And you stand on the hillside of the Pinex. We made a little podium. And uh, we actually don't know if they used a podium back then, but we figured fine. <laughs> Uh, so we have a podium, and it has a touch screen. And on the touch screen are all the controls for the data visualization. So we can set um, the time, the different architectural, uh, archaeological phases, so 500 BC, 450, 420, 320. These are all the different phases. And you can see them kind of overlaid on top of each other here. Um, and we actually use crowd simulation techniques to get the people into this space. Now, once you're in there, one of the fun things to do is to try to give a speech. And we actually, for this, hooked up a microphone to detect how loud you're speaking. And we did a little simulation to figure out what, how loud would you have had to talk in order to have people hear you. Which is, I mean, the thing that's so fascinating to me is, this is unusual, right? You'll see, we call this the yelling interface. And, okay, so actually I was about to say, how many interfaces have you seen with people yelling at their computers? But actually that probably happens quite a lot, right? <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> okay, so in this situation you're actually supposed to yell at your computer. Uh, so let me show you this. in ancient Athens gave authority to the people giving rise to the earliest and what would be the most successful democracy in ancient Greece. <laughs> this is one of my students, so then he got off his... <laughs> um, so this is, uh, so there's a lot of interesting things, and actually the, um, 
it's one of the few times when, you know, part of the understanding the data, because the data comes from, you know, the architectural reconstruction. They're actually there. They have um, measurements and things like that. So we've created these 3D models based on that. You know, but part of really getting a full sense of that data is putting yourself in it to be able to sort of wallow in your data. And, um, and so the scholar that we were working with, uh, Richard Graff is his name, um, you know, came in and he would just go back and forth between the different phases. And he would say, I remember sitting on this rock you know, and then he would flip to phase two. He'd say, oh, I see. It's actually part of the staircase, you know, and he would keep sort of looking back and forth, but it was fascinating because he could match it up with his own memory of being there today, you know. Um, so, uh, but then what he would do is fill it up with different numbers of people. What would this have looked like if there were 5,000 audience members? What would it have looked like if there were 10,000? You know, how many do I think would actually have been there? Um, and then if, when he was really in the mood, we could have him yell. <laughs> um, OK, so I've shown you uh, several projects today. I don't know if we're officially magical in our work yet. Um, but that's what I want to shoot for. Um, I want us to think about how we work with computers and how we interface with them in a way that is more like how we work with humans. We want to talk to them. We want to sketch. We want to paint. We want to gesture in the air. Um, and then we want to see things back. Show me data. Show it to me in a new way that I can actually understand. Okay. Um, and so that's what I think makes for a magical user interface and computing experience. Um, this is all. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So you're saying that the user can ask the computer to come up with the visual item of a concept that we talk to the computer and it would come up with this visual uh, or do we make the visual using the computer? Um, I guess a little of both it depends mm -hmm. um, in a lot of these situations the visual comes from some underlying data set, mm -hmm. like the biomechanics. Um, and then often what we are doing is not saying, show me the new concept, but let me find all the people who are similar in this way. You know, let me find all the people who have very small difference, you know, small distances between their vertebrae. You know, maybe there's some disc degeneration going on there. You know, and how is their motion affected? Okay, so to ask that question of the computer and then get a visual response back um, is the kind of thing that I'm interested in. Um, sometimes I tell people I do data visualization and they think, oh great, you're going to help me get a picture to put on the cover of a journal. <laughs> and, you know, we can do that. <laughs> I mean, uh, but actually what I prefer to do is think of it as a process. That I'm not trying to create a static picture necessarily. But what I'm trying to do is help to use a visual language to help you understand concepts um, that you work with when you're computing. It could be data. could be things you want to try to model yourself. And in that case, you are doing some of the creation yourself. Are you, are you talking about uh, the idea of using this? I don't know the name of it, but you can buy this thing, and you can put it in your, your house, and it can talk to you, and it can do things. You know, oh, like the Amazon Echo yeah, yeah. or right. Siri so or one of these. About the Echo, actually, uh, you can talk to the something like the Echo, and then the Echo would uh, create maybe something on your screen or your computer or your TV. I mean, or I don't know. Is that there, could be part of it. Are you visualizing doing that kind of a leap in your um, thinking? Yeah, maybe not there? quite that. Far in the sense that um, I, I'm really interested. This is uh, this is a perfect question, and I think that um, I am not so much interested in like describing something and then having the computer churn its wheels and like spit out, you know, oh, I did all the thinking for you. Here's the great new idea. 
What I'm much more interested in is to say the humans have great ideas, you know, and that actually, um, how do we get the human and the computer to work together better? And so, um, but part of that is that we have to be able to exchange information. Um, and I'd say that the best way for the computer to tell us things is through visuals. Um, the best way for us to tell the computer things is probably not the mouse and the keyboard. It's probably something with gesture. It's probably, it's probably some sort of voice uh, mixed in. But I, I hesitate a little with the idea of like, oh, I'm looking for you know, the cure to cancer. Could you turn on that for me? Yeah. And, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's, you know what I mean? There's, yeah. there's this balance kind yeah. of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a great. I, I don't know, you know, it's, it's uh, that's what the futurists do. They, they project. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's in that, it's in that direction. Yeah. Voice has to be part of it. Yeah. Um, I saw your hand go up. How does artificial intelligence fit into all this? So artificial intelligence might go a little bit more in that direction. Um, but um, it's part of this, too, in the sense of um, even, in, even in the case of the, the biomechanics, for example, um, often you can run an artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm or something like that to figure out um, how, you know, in this collection of 1,000 neck rolls, which, where are the anomalies? Which ones are different? Which ones sort of cluster together as being similar? You know, and, and from the artificial intelligence, it, it might be able to tell you, okay, well, I got this group over here, I got this group over here, you know, but, but it's often the case that it can't quite tell you why those things are different or what's interesting clinically that makes a difference there. And so what I'm interested in as it relates to artificial intelligence is like, okay, artificial intelligence, do your thing. Get me pretty close, but then come back to me, the human, and show me your results, and I'll sort of make the clinical interpretation, or you know, I'll sort of, oh, okay, so you see that group and that group is being different according to all your data metrics, you know, great. Why don't you show me a representative from that group and a representative from this one, and then let me see if I can sort of, using all my intuition, you know, figure out, okay, what is really the important difference between those? Uh, could, could, could I? dance choreographer do a chore some choreography on the computer and then it could be that the computer could pick up on the the information that the choreographer put in the computer and visualize the dance moves that might work for that choreography and the music pairing it together. Yeah, think I think something like that would be that? fascinating. Yeah, yeah. That be cool? yeah, that would be really neat. Yeah, I think that would be really neat. Yeah. Are you saying that oh. uh, you're teaching your students how to program in 3D with whatever conditions they want to put on this? Yeah. Programming. Yeah, they're learning all the 3D. Uh, the funny thing is, of course, they all get interested in this and they, they see my course description in the catalog and they want to take the course to learn about 3D graphics and they're thinking of the Pixar movies and Disney and you know and then they find out it's all math you know <laughs> you know I mean, basically what this is is a lot of linear algebra you know that figures out perspective transformations and there's matrices um, and so um, so that's a lot of what we end up teaching but of course, it allows you to create these pictures. So um, that's what your, your diagram was for, right? You've got n plus one, n minus one, uh, forward, backwards. Uh, yeah. Forward. Yes. That that was a, a graph. Uh, the one with the circles and the numbers and everything. That was uh, uh, to sort of do a clustering uh, and form a, a graph data structure. Yeah. There's one in the from, back. From a practical standpoint, from your last example there of the Colosseum, yeah. was he able to come up for some reason for doing all of the changes? Well, he came up with several hypotheses. Um, and so, the, the, for example, the staircase change, uh, he thinks maybe has to do with voting. You know? 
And then the other thing, I mean, of course, it's, it's, of course, whenever you work with somebody, you get them something, and then they say they want the next thing, right? So, of course, um, we had 10,000 people standing, and he says, oh, well, what if they're sitting? Oh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, so we're, we're in the process of, you know, continuing to kind of iterate on this. And, um, and he wants, you know, how long does it take everybody to move in and to move out under certain conditions? Um, and then our, our audio model right now is pretty simple. Um, but of course, you can do all this fancy acoustical engineering on the thing. Uh, you know, the same software they use to model if they make a new concert hall or something like this, to check all the acoustical properties, you could actually run here. Uh, and so we could do actually a really accurate simulation of what would it have been like to, to speak in this environment. Yeah. Uh, so we're, you know, these are the kinds of things we're going to next. Um, but it's really fun to work with him because he says, oh, this site, it's hardly seen any study. It's, scholars have only been looking at this for the last 200 years. You know? <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, we didn't have a computer 200 years ago. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, this is a, yeah. So there's a ton of databases out there. Uh, many of which might benefit from this. And I'm thinking, for example, the Center for Health Statistics, which is a part of the Centers for Disease Controls, has a lot of databases on a multitude of different health conditions, diseases, and the such. Now, that's using an existing database. And if I'm hearing you correctly, if we can visualize an existing database, we can perhaps for research, modify those databases to see what the outcomes might be. I'm thinking of, you know, let's say we have a database regarding uh, the spread of the Zika virus or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And we can visualize that. So what you're suggesting is we, we could alter that database with, I don't want to use the word fake, but, you know, different data. What if? See, with what, what if scenarios, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's something I'm really interested in. And I would say um, the, the things that I've been talking about could be applied, first of all, to understand what's in the existing database, which is probably, you know, all of these databases, if you, you, know, if you talk to the people, we say, oh, you know, how's it going with all your big data? And they say, well, honestly, we've looked at 5%. You know, and so it's one of these situations where there's, you know, the riches are out there and we're just not taking advantage of the data we have in the first place. But then what you're talking about is fantastic, where, you know, now that I have all this data information as kind of seed things, can I start asking, well, what if this changed? And what if this changed? And what if this changed? Um, and so we're starting to do that on some projects now. And when you ask that what if question, often what you have to do is run a, a simulation. And so uh, we work with the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, uh, which has its big supercomputers in the basement of Walter Library. Um, and we can actually, from within a visualization system, we can say, well, we're interested in this kind of thing and this kind of thing, and what if we change the length of this, or what if we do this other thing? And then we can spin off all these simulations. You know? And as they come back, we can see updated data. Um, and so that to me is just fascinating because you get then into the point where it really becomes a back and forth between the human and the computer and you're sort of as a team trying to solve a problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We've, we've run out of time, but thank you so much, Dan, for, for taking the time. He might be able to stay a few minutes if you have uh, uh, additional questions. Um, but we have about an hour break now before dinner, which is going to be at the Mariucci Arena. We have buses that are going to be leaving from the uh, Ackerman hangar, where probably if you took the bus where those buses uh, dropped you off. So we'll be walking you back there if you'd like to take that bus, and they'll be running on a loop between now and about 5 o'clock. Or you can um, have some free time and kind of wander around campus uh, and, and just uh, we'll be at the Mari Mariucci Arena at 5 o'clock for dinner. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back.